InnerQuest explores various pathways through which you can connect with the infinite wisdom of the universe and apply it to personal, professional, and spiritual growth. This program, featuring accomplished practitioners, educators, and authors, is provided by Infinity Foundation, an innovative center for holistic studies and research. We invite you to share this journey with us. Hello, welcome to InterQuest. My name is Jay Stone, your host for today, and our guest is Andrew Harvey. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for having me on. Andrew was born in South India in 1952. He has forged a vision of what he calls sacred activism, a fusion of mystical passion and wisdom with wise, radical action. And I'm holding uh, Andrew's book up here. It's a beautiful co cover. Who, who published this? Hay House, they're publishing it tomorrow, September the 15th. I'm thrilled. Oh, so this must be an advanced copy. This is an advanced copy. Good. All right. Um, so you're born in India. Uh, tell our audience uh, how, what you learned when you were growing up in India. Well, you know, India has been the center of my life. It's been the great inspiration of my life. I was born there, but what I really learned there was what it's like to live in a sacred world, what it's like to live in a world where everything you do is part of a sacred order. What I mostly learned was that there is only one God, one divine, and that all the religions are different expressions of now, this. Now, did somebody teach you these lessons, or is that something you just picked up through osmosis? Well, I had a wild Hindu cook who, when he wasn't drunk, was quite a metaphysician. Mm -hmm. And he used to draw me to one side and said, your parents are very nice people, but they're Protestant Christians, and you know, they can be a bit narrow. There is only one God. Hinduism believes that all paths lead to well, the one. Well, Judaism believes the same thing. Yes, it does. Now, um, where were your parents originally from? Well, my father was born in India. I have on my father's side 130 years of living in India. And my mother was also born in India. So India is very potent on both sides of my family. And I really believe that my whole life work started because I was born there and it gave me a passion for God which has never left me. Now, uh, reincarnation is a popular belief in India. Yes. And do you feel like um, social activism is often the result of what happened in a previous life? I don't know. I believe in reincarnation and I certainly believe that I was born in India for a purpose and my life has been about bridging East and West. How did you end up uh, immigrating to the United States? Well, at the age of nine I went to England and at the age of 21 I was elected a professor at Oxford and I became a fellow of All Souls at Oxford and I fled Oxford to go back to India what, at 25. What, what was your uh, teaching subject? I taught Shakespeare. I hmm. did a thesis on Shakespeare and Madness and I taught French literature and I talked and talked and talked and discovered that talking and living on irony and hors d'oeuvres wasn't quite the solution to life. So 25, I went back to India and had a series of very profound mystical experiences which shifted my vision of reality. And then I was looking around for something to do, so I was offered a job in America. I came at 28, and I've stayed ever since because I have a lover's quarrel with America, but I have an enormous, enormous respect for the American people. And I'm very proud that my career as a spiritual teacher has taken place here. It's been a very testing career and a very exciting career. Um, now, you've written how many other books? Actually, I've written 30 books. I'm astonished that I ever found the time or the energy to do so, but there are 30 other books out there, yeah. Wow, that's uh, quite an accomplishment. I know, it's exhausting even to <laughs> contemplate sometimes. <laughs> okay, um, and why is sacred activism so important now, in this time? Jay, we are in a tremendous world crisis. In fact, I believe that there are... Uh, there's a perfect storm of crises materializing at this moment, environmental, fundamentalist, to do absolutely every area of our life. And humanity is in tremendous danger. And this danger everybody knows about, although there is a very noisy denial going on. 
I believe from my own inmost experience that this great death is what I refer to it in my book is also the condition for a great birth. That in this death we are going to lose the illusions and the addictions that have actually made us suicidal to ourselves and very destructive to nature. Well, and I believe that the force that is going to birth this new humanity is what I call sacred activism. And sacred activism is very simply acting from sacred consciousness, acting from sacred awareness, marrying the two noblest passions in the human soul, the passion of the mystic for God with the passion of the activist for justice. And when you merge those two, I have found from my own experience and from studying the lives of great sacred activists like Gandhi and Martin Luther King and the Dalai Lama and Nelson Mandela, when you merge them, what you become is a humble instrument of divine love and wisdom in action. Now, before the show, you mentioned to me that uh, your father worked with Gandhi. Did, did He did, yes, he did. He was a policeman and he had the honor of actually being with Gandhi many times. Did you ever get to meet uh, Mahatma Gandhi? No, unfortunately not. Not in this life, because I was born two years after he was shot. Okay. But I have the... He was always my greatest idol as a young man. And I think the work that I've tried to do in sacred activism is profoundly influenced by his example, because Gandhi was not only a brilliant politician, he was also a kind of saint. And he fused together deep holiness with great practicality, and that's what I believe sacred activism well, does. Well, he uh, brought England he, to his knees with yes, non-violence. He brought England to his knees with a marvelous mixture of religious passion, extraordinary psychological and political acumen, he knew exactly how to play the English, and this amazing philosophy of non-violence that has actually influenced nearly all of the peaceful revolution since. Well, and I believe it comes from yoga because uh, the, the first uh, principle of yoga is nonviolence, yes. and then Martin Luther King uh, also uh, tried to follow Gandhi's example, and well, he did a tremendous job. Martin Luther King saved this country from a horrific bloodbath. The Dalai Lama is the supreme example of how powerful nonviolence can be while representing a point of view very strongly. Well, and, and uh, Dalai Lama has taken some criticism as of light for not taking a uh, a more a, a proactive role, but I believe he's doing it. I interviewed His, His Holiness actually on the day he won the Nobel Prize in Oslo, and I asked him why he hadn't been so, why he had been so committed to nonviolence, and he said there are two reasons. The first is that I believe that violence begets violence, and that to react with violence always creates resistance. And the second, he said, is that I know that if I advocated rebellion, the Chinese, in the state that they are, would commit genocide. So he had a very religious and a very practical reason. By the way, did you know Wayne Teasdale? Yes, very well. We were, we were pupils of the same great teacher. Yeah. We were heart brothers of, in our love for Father Bede Griffiths, who was the greatest in I, I, my I, life. I uh, read Wayne Teasdale's book and interviewed him. And wonderful, I, great, wonderful great soul. man. Great soul. Yeah, how, how, did, how was it that you came to interview Mahatman Oh, excuse me, um, the Dalai Lama on the day he won the Nobel Prize. Well, when I was 28, I went to a Himalayan kingdom called Ladakh, and my first book was called Journey in Ladakh, and that described my initiation into Tibetan Buddhism at the hands of a very great, amazing master whom I met in the Himalayas. Then I became very intimate with the Tibetan hierarchy, and actually I met His Holiness many times. I wrote a documentary in French about Tibet, and I had the honor of actually reading my translation to him as he sat in a little box. And then I was asked by the Tibetans themselves to collaborate with the great Tibetan master, Sogyal Rinpoche, to co-create and co-edit and co-write with him the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. So I've had a very deep, deep relationship with the Tibetans, and I've had the honor of meeting His Holiness several times. He is, for me, the greatest living teacher that we have on every level, I well, think. I, I, w I would agree with that. And did you have your interview planned on that day? Yes. And yes. He, he honored his commitment. Oh, we I spent won two Nobel hours Prize. together, which was I, absolutely amazing. I won the Nobel Prize. Oh, that's great. But I got to do this interview with Andrew. It's much funnier than that, actually. We were having a, this long interview. We were both very excited. And he, of course, is the most gracious and tender and humble person. And eventually he said, well, you know, I really have to go and get ready to get the Nobel Prize, so we have to stop now. <laughs> but 